So far, we have focused on deduction. Now, the last part of uh, this um, part of our lecture, I want to spend it on induction. As we saw earlier uh, in these slides, inductive reasoning, um, unlike deductive reasoning, it's not about certainty, but it's about probability. It's about how strong the case is for a conclusion to be true, given you know, some knowledge you already have, some set of premises, very often some observations. It's a very important aspect um, of inductions is that the premises don't quite guarantee that the conclusion has to be the case. They just might make a good or bad a case for them, so might make the conclusion more or less likely to be the case. And an important aspect of this is that for the most part, um, uh, inductions are, are often based on uh, prior experience. And the classic example would be something like this. You go out in the world and you observe that the first swan you see is white. You walk a little more and you see a second swan that one also is white and you go to a different park look around and, oh, look, there's another swan. Oh, that one's white too, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, until you see swan number 3,265, now that one also is white. And so you make the induction that all swans must be white. And, and of course, you know, it's a, it's a pretty good induction. I mean, you, you surveyed now 3,265 swans, um, all of which were white. I mean, it's a pretty good inference you know, you have pretty good data to say that all swans must be white. And, and of course, uh, that is the case until you go to Australia and you find out that some swans actually um, can, be, can be black. But, but this gives you a good understanding of how induction is probabilistic and is different from deduction. Um, but of course, it does raise a good question. Um, if, if we cannot be sure uh, of an inductive conclusion, and if the deductive, the inductive conclusion might be incorrect, why on earth would we ever use inductive reasoning? Um, and, and the answer is that this is about computational complexity. It, it just, these kind of inferences just help us reduce uncertainty and help us predict possible events. Yes, at the cost of being wrong, but there are many more circumstances where we can do inductive inferences than deductive inferences. And so it's very helpful to be able to make, you know, good guesses about what is most likely to happen, even though we accept that it might be, um, that it might be incorrect. And if you really think about it, most aspects of our life actually involve induction way more than they ever involve deduction. I mean, look, think about um, the most famous example by Hume, a philosopher who who really brought to prominence the idea of inductive reasoning in, in many ways. Um, and uh, and he, in fact, his point was that very little that you know is ever certain. Most things are inductive. But think about the, the fact that the sun rises in the morning and falls below the horizon um, in the evening. Do you know that it does that? Well, you don't know that it, it always will, you know, you definitely have a lot of good evidence and lots of observations that it has, but you don't exactly know that it has to be like this also tomorrow. It's very likely to happen. You expect it to happen, but based on everything you've seen up to today in your life, but look, things could change and maybe it doesn't. Think about it in more sort of, in terms closer to what we do every day. And, and this is a nice example from your book. Every time we step on the brakes of our cars, we expect it to stop. Now, we don't know that it will. We can't make a deductive argument that it will. We can make an inductive one. Every time I've stepped on the brakes, it's, it's worked and it stopped the car. I'm assuming that if I do it time, you know, N plus one, it will also do the same. And you know what? You put your hands, you, you put your life in the hands of induction very tight. Every time you cross the street and there's a car coming towards you, you, um, you induce that because usually people step on their brakes and their brakes stop their cars, um, the next person will also do it. You don't know that. It's not a deduction. You don't know that for certain, but you know, you got a pretty good guess. 
And indeed, you're right most of the times. But you can appreciate how, how profound and how important inductive reasoning is in the context of our lives. Our lives really seem to be mainly driven by induction as opposed to deduction. In fact, a lot of the things that you really think you really, really know with certainty tend to be inductions. Now, often when we study induction, we tend to differentiate different kinds of inductive reasoning. Um, a, a very, uh, very frequent one is a generalization. So this is when you extrapolate from a limited number of observations, um, some kind of conclusion that applies to a broader category. This is when people often say, um, partially incorrectly that induction goes from observations to generalizations, this is what they mean. From, from observations to sort of broad laws or, or broad conclusions. This is what they mean. You see one swan, you see two swans, you see three swans, every single swan is white. You infer that, you know, you infer the rule that all swans are white. So this is what we refer to as generalization. Um, a different uh, type of inductive inference is what we refer to as a statistical syllogism. Now, this is when we go from observations about a group, observations that are likely inside a group, to inference about a specific individual. Um, and these type of syllogisms typically make use of qualifying words like most or frequently or almost never or, or rarely, or in fact, they might even have statistical generalizations within um, uh, their premises. Let me give you an example. Almost all peop people are taller than 26 inches. And notice the, the keyword almost, right? We're making a generalization um, in, in this particular, uh, in that um, premise. So almost all people are taller than 26 inches. Rady is a person. Stands to reason that Rady is taller than 26 inches. It doesn't have to be. It's not deductive, but, you know, it's likely. Finally, the third type um, of um, inductive reasoning that we often study is known as the argument from analogy. And it's incredible how pervasive this type of reasoning is. You encounter it, you might, you might not realize it, but you probably do this and you hear this all the time. In fact, strikingly, uh, strikingly so. Now, arguments from analogy uh, are arguments where, you know, you observe that two things might, might share some number of properties. And based on that, you infer inductively that they might share also some other property. So from a formal point of view, it might look like this. Um, object X and object Y are similar in both having properties Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, Qn. Um, object X also has property P. Therefore, it stands to reason that object Y might also has property P, even though, you know, you haven't seen it, you don't know it. Here's a wonderful example of this. There might be life on Europa because it has an atmosphere that contains oxygen just like Earth. So the point is, Europa and Earth share a certain property, which is having... Uh, having an atmosphere that contains oxygen, Earth also contains life. Therefore, by analogy, it's, it's, it's possible that Europa might also harbor life, right? It's a very frequent type um, of argument that we make. In fact, it's so frequent that I'd like to warn you with the words of Plato. Arguments that make their point by means of similarities, just like arguments from analogy, are imposters. And unless you're on your guard, will quite readily deceive you. So you've been warned. Now, I should say that um, a great example um, of induction at play um, uh, is the fact that induction plays a fundamental role um, in uh, human learning. Um, and one form of induction uh, in human learning is evident in children. And we've discussed this uh, earlier in this series, and is the so-called one-shot learning. Now, the context is the following. You know, the child is there, and the mother, in this case, is pointing at an object, maybe saying a, a label, a name. 
how's the child to know what exactly the mother was referring to? You know, in this case, maybe she says balloon or maybe she says dog. I don't know, one of the two. Um, how's the child going to know what aspect of the object the label should refer to? Right? Is she saying blue? Is she saying smooth and shiny? Is she saying dog? Is she saying balloon? So what is, what is the label that the mother is using here? Um, what, is it, what is it referring to? It turns out children actually are very good with one example um, at inducing what, um, what the, the proper, what, what it is that is being referred to. Um, and so this, this is why it's now known as one-shot learning. Uh, but if you think of it, this requires a giant leap in inductive reasoning, right? You get one example, one observation, and suddenly you, you're convinced that you know, right? From now on, you, you can generalize. Every time you see something that is a balloon, you're going to use the word balloon just because of this one time that you've seen it. Um, and of course, this is great because it, <laughs> it allows children to acquire vocabulary very quickly and to understand how vocabulary works and what it relates to. Um, uh, but of course, the question is how exactly uh, can children achieve this? And how can we have one-shot learning? Now, one explanation for one-shot learning is so-called Bayesian inference. Now, just to explain what that is, Bayesian inference is a mathematical framework that allows you to use what you already know in order to make inferences, in order to make educated um, guesses. You know, my, my favorite example of this, we've already seen it in this class, but is this, if I were to show you the object on the left, and we're to ask you, what do you see? What do you think this represents? Most people are going to say, well, it's a square that is slightly overlapping with a circle. Very few people would say it's a square that is sort of adjacent to a little Pac-Man. And see, according to Bayesian reasoning, to Bayesian inference, the reason why we typically answer with this as opposed to this other one is because, because we have higher priors on circles than we have on Pac-Man, meaning in life, when we go about our life, we see lots of, uh, lots of circles. We don't see many Pac-Men. So when you're undecided between the two, it stands to reason, given what you already know, right? Given your priors, that it's a circle in a square. It's a circle um, slightly occluded by a square as opposed to a Pac-Man adjacent to a square. Um, uh, because again, circles are much more common. So this is what uh, this is what Bayesian inference is for. And so the reason um, the reason why this is a, it might be a successful way of explaining one shot learning is that maybe children um, quickly develop expectations, which would be the priors, as to what kind of stuff gets names, and you know at, at what level tip people typically refer to objects. And this kind of knowledge is what allows them to quickly learn in this kind of one-shot learning. Under many conditions, um, I would say that most experiments find that people tend to engage uh, in, in reasonable um, induction um, when sort of trying to consider whether there is a strong support for a conclusion or not. Uh, there are, however, some notable um, exceptions, and perhaps the strongest one of all is the one that we've already seen earlier which is confirmation bias. Um, so this is, again, the tendency of people to, to, to really look for and strongly evaluate evidence that supports whatever they already think or whatever they believe, and not to look for, and in fact, sometimes even ignore, evidence that goes against whatever they already know or already believe. One very nice um, demonstration of this um, was uh, by Nian and Rafler in 2010. And they did something sort of very, um, very relevant to today's discourse. Um, they gave participants mock news articles. And these articles contained some kind of misleading claim from a politician that just happened to conform to the, the whatever were the political beliefs of the participant. Now, Half the, the participants sort of read this, this article. Um, half of the participants read these mock news stories, but then also received an actual, received a fact check. We're told, oh, by the way, you know, 
you read that claim, but look, here's, here's what the facts are. Turns out, after this, when asked both groups of participants, um, if they believed in, in, that misleading, um, in that misleading piece of information, actually it turns out that participants who received the correction reported either just, either just as much or even higher degree of conviction in the misleading claim compared to two participants who did not receive the correction. So this is really a nice demonstration of how people strongly discount information that is contrary to whatever they already believe. And, and, and on the other hand, um, give you know, much greater weight to information that supports whatever they think. And perhaps it also tells you that as much as we all discuss about the importance of fact checking in today's discourse, um, whether or not they will ultimately move the needle might not necessarily be clear.